Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor and the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app. We're on Red Circle as well as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Five Reasons YouTube channel, where this week we will have a lot of Miami Dolphins and NFL draft content. So if that interests you, make sure you subscribe to the channel. You get more than just Five on the Floor, although we appear there as well. Also check out Playback. We're on there during every game. That's where we stream the game for you and we chat with you. And we sometimes we even bring you to the stage Go to www.playback.tv backslash five. That's the number five RSN. www.playback.tv backslash five RSN. As long as you have a cable hookup, it is free to sign up. Also, check out the great sponsors of the Five Reasons Sports Network. That includes prize picks. Use the code five F I V E. Get that initial deposit matched up to $100. This is our official fantasy partner. Just rated the number one fastest growing sports product in the country. You can get it from prizepicks.com the Google Play Store, or the Apple App Store. You're just playing props, going over or under on players. If you went over on Jimmy Butler yesterday, you won pretty easily. Go to prizepicks.com. You can also play MLB, NHL, MMA, boxing. It's all there. Again, prizepicks.com. But make sure to get your initial deposit matched up to $100. You use the code 5. And now, today's episode. Down to Biscay. Yay. Uh, five on the floor, ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing, you can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck the said, you in trouble, y'all. Kept the floor plan, got an all band. Y'all seen the block, stop the one hand. And Pat, we trust, it's power, have the guts. We're here to bring the heat, y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, Ethan Skolnick back on Five on the Floor. Here's today's floor plan. I got Greg Sylvander. You can follow him at Greg Sylvander. I think I'm going to call this a floored plan. Um, I still don't know what to make of last night. We did a podcast where you guys did a podcast. I appeared on Hangover Time, which was on our channel. I did a video from the arena, which is on our YouTube channel as well. I did Starting Five, which is the new name for Starting Nine this morning. I still don't know what to make of last night, Greg. Um, <laughs> and it's crazy. You know, I've been in the building for a lot of these. And you just never know when you're going to get a moment. That's the thing about this franchise. And that is why through all of the frustrations, which we have spent pretty much the last six months documenting, there's always that sliver of hope that there's going to be a moment. You know, there have been moments in bad seasons. I mean, Dwayne Wade's last season was not great for the team, but there were plenty of moments. There were moments when Deion Waiters was around. There have been moments for some of the most forgettable teams in Heat history. I don't know that I expected a moment quite like that. And that's even though we titled an episode, I think four days ago, does Jimmy Butler have another moment in him? And yeah. and I, I <laughs> and, and that's really all we wanted. And now it's kind of time to get greedy because they're up 3-1 against the team that was a co-favorite to come out of the Eastern Conference that had its MVP candidate back yesterday, that had Middleton there, although it didn't look like it the last few minutes, that had Drew Holiday, that had Brooke Lopez, that has won a championship with his exact same core four just three years ago. And now at this point, they're up 3-1. Like, they should close out this series. And we will feel badly, obviously, as Heat observers and Heat fans will feel badly if they don't. But either way, we just had a moment yesterday that I just don't think that we thought we were going to get this year. And that moment, to me, is up there with any of the other Heat hey, moments. Rick. Right? And, and we've spent the last, like, what is it? What's It's 12 o'clock now. We spent like the last 12, 13 hours trying to put it into some kind of historical context. And we'll get into that historical context even more here. But Greg, the fact that like we're looking at that game last night and what Jimmy Butler did scoring 56 points, making shot after shot after shot against every possible coverage, every possible defender in every possible situation. And we're like, 
okay, is that the best performance? Is that the second best? Is it the third best? Is it the fourth best? Is it the sixth best in Heat history? And when we have to say that, a franchise has a pretty rich history. Like, that's pretty much what I'm coming out with here. But I will say, just flat out, it's the best more with less performance I've ever seen in Heat history. And if that's a cop-out, because I can't necessarily put it ahead of LeBron in Boston game six. and Because of the stakes. Never... Right, because of the stakes. The stakes were not the same. But the performance itself on its own is there with anything LeBron did and is there with anything Dwayne did in any single game. I don't think there's any question about it. It's that. true. It, it, it was a master class that is up there with all of those games. Um, and that was like, if you just take everything out of it and let's just strip it all down and say hoops, we're talking about hoops, basketball, that Jimmy Butler game was as big of a masterclass, as much of a masterclass, I should say, as any heat performance that's ever happened. It's that historic. And to me, what Jimmy Butler is essentially proving to us time and time again is that he's that good, is that he has the – there's something about the playoffs and there's something about the way that you're honing in on one team and there's something about the fact that you are seeing the same team again and again. It feeds right into what Jimmy's strengths are from a mental perspective, and he becomes a different type of animal. And when he can propel you to victory like this, he was dragging them in the first half. I mentioned it on Five on the Floor last night. But then in the, in the, late in the game, to just go on that type of run, it was Dwayne Wade-esque, and I don't want to even say that because this was a Jimmy Butler performance it's on its own. It needs to stand on its own. It gets its own place in Championship Alley as that type of moment. And we asked for a moment, Ethan, we got one. This is – go forward. This is how I look at it. They got three shots to eliminate the Milwaukee Bucks. I think that they got to get um, one of the next two because obviously that game seven situation, you don't love that idea. But this is all circling back, Ethan, to this one point. When you have Jimmy Butler playing like this, capable of this, everything is possible. Like you can't rule out anything because he's now proven to us, whether it be last year in games like game six up there in Boston, when everyone thought that that thing was looking on the brink or uh, what he is doing now. I mean, he had these performances last year in the playoffs and we were all talking playoff Jimmy and he's literally came out this year and, and one upped that entire experience in just this short amount of time, four games. So to me, uh, it's the absolute story of the playoffs so far to me is Jimmy Butler's performance through four games and they got to win this series. But ultimately if Jimmy's at the height of his powers, all the more call for them to, I mean, did you see the way players were tweeting Ethan last night? Like it is a known fact around the league, what Jimmy Butler is a playoff as a, is as a playoff performer. And so they got to get the right re requisite amount of playoff level talent around him. And that's yeah. a conversation for another day. But when you see the league react, you start to think, gosh, they could use one more guy and they're down a couple guys, but they, they, he needs help. I wonder if one of those guys that tweeted or watched last night wants to be that other guy. And that's the question going forward and, and the one that we don't have the answer to and won't until some player forces their way out of a situation because it feels like that's really the only way they're going to be able to significantly upgrade this roster. And, and I do think, although we want to, again, stick to, I, I think, more of the historical element of this, it is worth asking this question. And I asked it last night on hangover time, and I'll keep asking it. When you see Jimmy Butler do what he did last night, and you see the possibility now of them eliminating the top-seeded Milwaukee Bucks and then potentially playing a Knicks team, which is very good, uh, I think uh, very well-constructed, I believe, very well-coached, but definitely beatable. And you could put yourself into a position because you likely will have the best player on the floor in that series again, as good as Jalen Brunson has been, and I put him ahead of uh, Julius Randle based on what each does in the playoffs or has done in the playoffs the past couple of years. 
And you could have a situation where Jimmy Butler drags this team back to the Eastern Conference Finals against the Boston Celtics again, because I I do favor them to beat Philadelphia. And it does, again, raise this question. Does that get this front office and this organization off the hook for not doing more to support Jimmy Butler? And I start with not just personnel moves, but also the, what the overhang on the personnel moves, which is the luxury tax and the unwillingness to pay it, or does this bring up the other part of that, which is the more negative side of this, which is, okay, if you have a player like this and you've been saying this all season, don't you have to go all in and don't you have to get him more help and don't all the excuses about that kind of melt away. And that's kind of where we're headed here. And we want to celebrate what happened last night. And like I said, I didn't think we were going to get moments like this, this season, because it has been such a struggle. It's been a drag. I mean, it has not been fun to cover. There hasn't been a lot of joy. And just to see the joy with the players last night, when Jimmy makes that shot, uh, which we counted as a two, but the one in transition. And you see Kevin Love, who was, you know, unceremoniously <laughs> dumped by the Cleveland Cavaliers, a team he won a championship with, a team that has no bench, by the way, whatsoever, which is one of the reasons they're losing uh, to the Knicks in that series. And you see his joy where he's doing the Norris Cole, one of our friends here. He's, you know, 12 feet off the ground when Jimmy hits that shot. And you see Spolster and Lowry, two guys who've kind of gone through it this year, you know, with their arms around each other. They deserve this joy for fighting. Okay. Did you see Jovic's face when he looked up at the stats and he recognized what Jimmy had? He like looked at Jimmy Butler like, oh my gosh, I'm on the same team as that guy. It was a great shot that they caught. And I, I think that matters too, because I think when Jimmy drives his teammates so hard, with the way he practices and just the way he is, you know, there have to be these kind of moments where Jimmy validates all of that work. Right. And, and so, and, and they recognize, you know, that what he puts into it and what he gets out of it. And then there's a method to his madness. And I mean the word madness. I mean, he is mad in terms of the way that he prepares in terms of the way that he approaches the game from an IQ perspective um it's it's off the charts but it's also you know a little bit psycho the way that he goes about this stuff and and so to have you know the players kind of see it in real time and see what he can accomplish because of all the work he puts in and because of the way he approaches it it should translate at some point to some of them now not to all of them and you know we have conversations we're going to have about bam which we're going to do on a later episode today we're probably going to bring uh, Brady or Alex in for that as we look ahead to the next game for more of an X's and O's standpoint. But I, I do think that what we have right now is this organization belongs to Jimmy Butler. Okay. Contractually, but also spirit spiritually. Okay. And the question will become as they go forward and we see how far they go in this run, what are they going to do to supplement that? Because, Again, to put last night into perspective, all right, Dwayne Wade is a top three shooting guard of all time who would have been even greater if his career was not curtailed by a variety of injuries, especially the knee injuries. LeBron James may be the best player of all time. If not, he's in the top three. Jimmy Butler did things last night that neither of them did. Like... (laughs) You know, again, LeBron's performance in Boston was unbelievable. And I always talk about sitting at Legal Seafoods the night before in Boston, and I'm going through the tweets, and I cannot find a Heat fan that night in 2012 who thought they were going to win that game. There was nobody. I've met during the Big Three era. I don't think that the Heat fans collectively, at least the ones on social media, were as despondent and pessimistic as they were prior to that game. And we knew what was going to happen if LeBron didn't do something miraculous because Bosch was not himself. He came back from the rib cage problem. He was not himself yet. And Dwayne was not the kind of guy at that point who could necessarily carry you. He had moments, but you couldn't expect it at that stage. Really, the previous season was the last time that you could kind of expect it consistently. And he went into that game with everything on the line, not just the fact that the Heat – 
were in the bullseye of everybody in the national media. OK, and he was specifically. But so was Eric Spolster and so was Chris Bosch. We were talking and shooting around. Oh, my in, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Remember, in TV Garden. And I remember Ira and I and Barry and other. And we're like, this might be Spo's last game, right? They were like saying they, on the networks, Ethan, everything is over. Like right. That. <laughs> right. And and, and, with, and what was the other move that was going to be made was probably Chris Bosch being traded because we talk about it. Pat Riley always trades the third guy, uh, whether it was Mashburn or Eddie Jones. And Bosch was the third guy at this point, kind of like Tyler is now. And so we thought it was over. And for LeBron to do that, and my column that night that I wrote, who was I? I was working for the Palm Beach Post at the time. We were sitting in the crowd. And so they, because the TD Garden, they put you in the crowd. So we had a table right there in the crowd. And there was some really obnoxious, believe it or not, Boston fans behind me. I saw a lot of those at the Bruins Panthers game the other day, starting all the fights. There were a bunch of uh, uh, Celtics fans and they spent the whole first quarter mocking LeBron and mocking the heat, calling him all the usual names, Delante West, all the stuff that they do in Boston. Right. And over time they succumbed. Like it was just like, it was and my whole column. I didn't even go to the locker room because I didn't have time that night because my deadline was so tight. <laughs> my my column was chronicling these three fans behind me going from you're a loser. You know, all the, I can't do Boston accents. I should have Chris Joseph on. OK, all the rest of, to all of a sudden, LeBron, stop, stop. Mercy. We had a screaming enough. uncle. And yo. that's what they were doing. That was my and that was my whole column. I just transcribed it. It was a, this is what he did to them that night. So the stakes of it. OK, and he scored what 45 of the 97. I think he had timely help from guys like. Jimmy had last night, OK, mostly on defense that we've talked to Norris about that, that the team played a tremendous defensive game against the Celtics, which allowed LeBron to LeBron's points to matter. I mean, he didn't even crack 100. So the stakes were remarkable. Dallas, Dwayne, emerging superstar, right? Coming into his own third season, they're down 2-0 in that series, down 15 in game three. We ain't going out like that at home. And then what he did, not just in game three, but in game five, and I was at all of those games, NBA finals, the stakes are always going to be more significant than at any other time. And then Jimmy's own series against the Lakers in 2020, uh, the two games in particular, and then the two games against the Celtics, especially game six last year. So the stakes were higher in all those first round. I mean, the Heat, when the Heat have good teams, we're not even used to caring about the first round. Like, well, I mean, Ron, to your right? Point, LeBron's teams lost two games. To your point, Ethan, this is the craziest thing. I went and looked this up because we were talking about this post game because we brought up the same games you're bringing up. Do you know LeBron's actual playoff high with the Heat was 49 against the Brooklyn Nets in like a throwaway series that none of us even remember happening? And that was in 2014. And Dwayne's playoff career high was 46 in 2010 when mm -hmm. he probably would have won a finals MVP. In that run, I forgot what team it was against. He got 46. It was Boston. It, and it was, we don't it, even it, really it, remember those games. We remember these others that you're talking about. No, so all, that's all, how crazy this is. All I remember about Dwayne doing that, that was in the Boston series. What I remember about Dwayne, because Atlanta was the year before. Oh, what that's right. About, that's right. What, what I remember about Dwayne with that was that was when Dwayne went to the podium in TD Garden after and the said, final I'm not game. doing this again. Yeah, I, I, I need help. Uh, I need help. And they got him more help than any team has ever gotten a player before. But he was tired of carrying that thing because they withheld help for two years so that they could prepare for 2010. And the only thing that would have changed that was if Lamar Odom uh, had had actually signed with them. And even then, they probably would have figured out a way to make it work. So you look at those performances again. Dwayne's performances in the playoffs, finals, bigger stage. LeBron, biggest stakes that this organization's really ever had because they they were going to be accused of the biggest fumble of any bag in NBA history. You're given LeBron and Chris Bosh and you can't win a championship. Like everything with the scrutiny on that team and the way that team was being evaluated, literally Eric Spolster probably may not have gotten another job in the league again as a head coach. Okay, He would have been an assistant somewhere. At Bosch, it would have been declared a failure and he was traded. 
if LeBron doesn't come through in that game. So you can't compare this because this is a Heat team that we did not expect to go anywhere. The national media has no expectations whatsoever of them. If they lost, they lost. They just drift out into the sea. Okay, sort of like the Atlanta Hawks this year okay, are going to do uh, or or the Nets did. Okay, or I guess Memphis is even going to make louder noises when they go out than the Heat would have made if they went out. Right. Okay, and, and the Clippers, too, okay, would have made louder noises. So there's no real expectation on this squad. So that's the only thing that bumps Jimmy down or this performance down. But the actual, as you said, the hoops part of it, just the pure basketball part of it with what was around him and what wasn't, okay? Because he has an all-star playing with him right now who is not playing like an all-star. And we'll get into more of that in the next episode here, but because of the various injuries Bam may be dealing with, but also he has not been the same since the all-star break. And we've chronicled that. He's not been a real number two to Jimmy since the break when he was actually a co-number one prior to the break. And he doesn't even have Tyler now, and then he doesn't have Vic, who was giving them some moments, even if he wasn't a core rotation player. He's out there yesterday playing with Kyle Lowry, who we have spent the entire season criticizing, okay, and who we thought was going to get traded at the deadline or permanently shelved, okay? Gabe Vincent, who really has not been up to the moment in the postseason. Duncan Robinson, who nobody wanted to play anymore. <laughs> is now playing crunch time minutes. He, he wasn't playing crunch time minutes the whole year. Max Struess, who has one really strong game now and then like two that you don't notice him. The only guy that he can count on night after night, possession after possession, is Caleb Martin, who's on a three-year, $20 million contract. We have never seen anybody do more with less. People were trying to throw Dwayne at me last night and saying, No way. And they were like, well, Shaq wasn't Shaq in the finals. He averaged 13 points. I recognize that. One of the reasons Shaq only averaged 13 points in the finals. They were doubling him. (laughs) Yes. Avery Johnson wouldn't stop. It's one of the worst coaching decisions in NBA history because you don't double that Shaq so consistently. Yes, other Shaqs, previous Shaqs, not that Shaq. He kept doing it. He kept getting asked about it. He kept doing it. And so Dwayne was able to slither wherever he wanted. I'm not taking anything away from Dwayne's performance, but Dwayne also had Antoine Walker, a former all-star out there, James Posey, who was like a stronger Caleb Martin, okay? Gary Payton, who is a championship-type player, even if he wasn't in his prime. Jason Williams, who is a big upgrade over what the Heat have at point guard right now, okay, at least offensively. That's what he had, and Udonis Haslam, like in like entering his own prime. I mean, that's what he had around him. And Zoe Jimmy doesn't have, and, and oh yeah, and Zoe, right? Like, right, like the heartbeat of the entire franchise who could still give you 13 remarkable frenzied minutes as he did in game six, backing up Shaq. Like, I mean, they had Michael Doliak as their third center. Michael Doliak would be getting minutes on this team, on this Heat team. So I, look. Dwayne had plenty around him. It's just that Dwayne elevated to such an extent, okay, that, I mean, game after game after game after game after game. It's an average 34.7 in an NBA Finals in your third season as the teams – you will never – you may not ever see that again, okay? So that, for sustained excellence on the biggest stage, it's Dwayne. For biggest stakes, it's in terms of – historical stakes it's that lebron game six because it changes his whole legacy it does it changes the heat's course changes the heat's legacy the heat don't win the two championships during that that uh, big three era without it eric smolster never becomes a hall of fame coach without it okay but i'm just talking basketball like last night there was nobody there around him uh i mean that that he could count on everybody gave him moments okay that last the final five all bam defensively on Giannis was tremendous at the end, Caleb had one of the great role player clutch shots in NBA history in Giannis's face after chasing a ball across the entire front court. Okay, while five bucks stood and watched him. Okay, that is Heat culture uh, embodied. Okay, that play, uh, and 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 then Duncan just creating the spacing there and some of the things that he did. So he got enough help from them. But come on, okay, that's there's no comparison to what LeBron had around him in Boston that night. And there's no comparison to what Dwayne had around him in those NBA finals. So we'll talk about it more after the break. And I want, I want to go to you to close here 
Uh, but I, I think it's the it's the best single game basketball performance I've ever seen live. That that's how I'll put it. And and maybe Barkley was exaggerating a little bit and taking a little bit of a poke at LeBron and others because he tends to do that by saying it's the best game he's ever seen on television, or the best performance he's ever seen on television. But honestly, if he meant it, I don't blame him because I <laughs> I don't know Listen, how you could get better. The video that you posted, you could really hear the arena. And I've had more than one person unprompted hit me up that was in that building, either working or otherwise, uh, and meaning that they've been there for many games. And they said it was as loud when Jimmy got that steal and that dunk and the Heat took the lead as they can remember that arena being. So I, I, I don't blame Barkley for having, even if people are saying prisoner in the moment, we, 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 Jimmy's performance deserves that kind of, those kind of flowers today. Yeah, I think we'll all gladly be prisoners of that moment, right? And it's, it's crazy. Dwayne always talked about moments, and he helped deliver a guy here who's basically become the bridge extension of the Dwayne moments. Um, he is, in so many ways, he does it a little differently, but sometimes when I watch Jimmy in those moments, I see Dwayne. I, I really I really do. It's like you see a little Dwayne, you see a little Kobe, you see a little, dare we say, MJ. I mean, that's kind of where he was that's the level he was at nobody who was ever at that game is going to forget it they're just not like it's 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 just one man against the world and that's how he likes it that's how he likes it and he's so contrarian i always say this and i've said this so many times in the pod if you tell jimmy he's great he'll tell you he's just a guy if you tell jimmy he's just a guy he'll tell you he's the best basketball player in the world and even last night our brady hawk asked him about playoff jimmy and he says that's not a thing Brady's voice is on ESPN, every major network asking the question. I love it. Well, we got playoff Brady going on too. Check out his thread. Playoff Jimmy is a thing. It's a thing. Okay. And and we can't, uh, I have to be more careful criticizing the team for the way they handle him now, because I, I couldn't stand it the whole regular season when they would wait until six minutes left in the fourth and they wouldn't push his minutes beyond 32 and he wasn't playing on back-to-backs. Well, I guess now we're seeing the payoff, the plan with the heat, the plan with Chris Brickley, his uh, his skills trainer, I I mean they've handled that perfectly, right? I mean you I mean and you can't guarantee everything. I thought they handled the depot situation perfectly too, but sometimes life just happens. But in this case, you've got him playing like the best player in the world at the most important time. That's I, I mean something something went very very right there. All right, we do want to tell you about some sponsors who can help make things uh, right for you. Uh, one of the things that you may need if you work in a hospital, you might need C-arm equipment. And we've got a guy, Nelson, who can rent it out to you on, short, on a short or long-term basis, whether it's the hospital, surgery centers, chiropractic offices, or pain management offices. Offices They also offer cadaver lab courses. Reach out to him. Big Miami Heat fan. So, so many of our sponsors are. Reach out to him at c-armandstaffing.com. That's c dash armandstaffing.com you can fill out the form there and he'll get right back to you he'll also get right back to you on his phone 561-891-9620 that's 561-891-9620 it's c dash arm and staffing.com again they rent out the c-arm equipment to offices they also send out an x-ray technologist to run the machine so if you work for a hospital a doctor's office you're going to want to reach out to nelson um, just and they're good people too. They've come, he and his family have come to our watch parties. They'll take really good care of you. Make sure you mention five reasons. Again, c armandstaffingcom 561-891-9620. Also want to mention our friend Mark Brown. If you're looking for an estate plan and if you have a child, you should. Okay. I know the word estate. It's like everybody's like, oh, I don't have millions of dollars. It doesn't matter. Whatever you have, you worked for it, right? You really want it in probate. You want your kids to be fighting over it? No. Make sure that it goes to the right place. Mark can help you fill out all the forms. He's also a real estate attorney. So whether it's a bankruptcy, a closing, I can tell you he's handled two of my closings and done a masterful job at it. Um, and he's just a really good dude and another huge Miami Heat fan who's texting me during the game. It's markbrownpa.com. And that's M-A-R-C, brownpa.com. Or reach out direct at 954-566-5678. That's 954-566-5678. He's based uh, right off of Cypress Creek and Andrews in North Lauderdale. Um, just call him for an appointment today and a free consultation. All right, as we go forward here, all right, we will get into the X's and O's more a little bit later today. But just from 
a feels situation. It feels like the Bucks have no answer for Jimmy Butler. And I was in Boonholzer and Brooke Lopez's pressers last night, and then Alex waited on Giannis. Giannis didn't speak to the media yesterday, which is rare because he's one of the most accommodating superstars in all of sports. So I don't know if that's health related or he was frustrated or what, but he's not a petulant child like, you know, let's say the Memphis Grizzlies, who every time they lose, they don't talk. Um, it just feels like they don't have answers. And, and I'm looking at their their numbers. I mean, again, Jimmy's done it against all of them. I mean, they have three all NBA level defenders on that team and Giannis, Drew, and Brooke. And he's torched all of them equally. in different ways, too. Right. <laughs> Uh, I, I think this is the game five is going to be difficult because they're going to have the crowd behind him. Giannis is back. Um, I would imagine that they're going to probably shoot pretty darn well, although they haven't shot necessarily so bad in, 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 in Miami. So I think that uh, there is, a, there is an element of them not understanding how the hell that, what the hell they're going to do about Jimmy um, that maybe in a game five scenario on the road, you're going to get a bunch of other guys wide open. And we know how Jimmy Butler works. He, he like, he could have 12 assists in game five and you get a bunch of three point shooters going, but ultimately there's, this is what I I took from last night. There's only one guy that can top what Jimmy Butler did last night. And that's Jimmy Butler. And so I, It'll be interesting to see game five, but ultimately if this ends up back in Miami, either way, um, this is about Jimmy Butler getting this team through Milwaukee. And I think Milwaukee knows that, and it'll be interesting to see what type of adjustments they cook up. And y'all are going to talk a lot more about that on the next episode. Yeah. I, when you say the only guy who can top Jimmy Butler is Jimmy Butler. I, I do agree from an individual perspective that that is likely the case here because I feel like, as good as Giannis was last night, there's still something a little missing there. I, I couldn't put my finger on it. Um, he was trying to stay warm. Like he would not sit down during timeouts. He was walking around because he I, he didn't want to tighten up. Okay. He just had a flight back to Milwaukee. Um, I don't know how he was feeling after the game. He looked fine before the game. He was sitting in his locker on his headphones. He seemed like cool with everything. And again, he put up ridiculous numbers last night. He's that good. He's played through pain before he did it to win a championship. Nobody thought he was going to come back that quickly from the knee injury, but, but I don't feel, I don't know. I, I, even though I do still believe he's the best two way player in the world, I don't feel like the takeover is going to be in him. Like it's been in there with Jimmy. And I think part of it with Jimmy is that Jimmy is better when he looks around and he knows it's just him. And we've talked about that this season because it's sort of Bam has that kind of similar mentality, which is why they both had their best games when the other has not had a big game or has not been present. But right now, I think Jimmy has just gotten in his head that he just can't count on anybody else. And he is most dangerous when that is the case. And so Kobe was like that. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny that we don't see more of that comparison, actually, because I think from a mentality standpoint. Yep. Right. He has a lot of Kobe in him, you know, especially like late career Kobe. Um, I came to respect Kobe more and more over time. I thought some of the stuff early with him, he kind of could be a petulant child at times too early in his career. Uh, but just his unwillingness to, and he wasn't as efficient as people made him out to me. And he wasn't quite as clutch as people made him out to be. If you look at the numbers, he was nowhere near as clutch as Jimmy is by the percentages. But this unwillingness to let his team lose when everybody thought that they would. And it seemed like he got more up for it when everybody thought that they would lose. And Jimmy is not a great front runner. And neither is – I think Eric Spolster is better when he's not a front runner either. Amen. And, right. And that's why I loved this series for them. But now they're up. And now the question is can they get into that underdog mentality – Maybe that building, maybe the way that they're going to be trying to save their season in Milwaukee, because this is a total fail season if they lose to the Heat in the first round. Giannis or no Giannis for that one and a half games, this is a total fail season for them. Okay, they're going to hear it the whole offseason because those guys have been paid. They're they champions. Spent money. Yeah. They spent money. They added to their core with role players. They spent five second round picks on Jake Crowder, who's been a complete no-show 
They're going to blame series. it on Middleton and let him walk, probably. <laughs> right, right, exactly. That's where they're they're in the Heat's position from a few years ago. Except they've won a championship. The Heat really, in that regard, still have nothing. If the Heat blow this series again, the national media is not going to give a damn. They're going to move on to Bucks Celtics. Okay, after Celtics uh, Sixers or Bucks Sixers, if that's the case, the Heat have to stay in that underdog mentality because that's where that's where they live. That's where they they are they were not comfortable being a one seed last year. It's not a comfortable place for this particular Heat group. It's a bunch of undrafted guys and Jimmy Butler, who was almost a second round pick. He was picked 30th overall after going to junior college, after being homeless, after growing up in Tomball. They need to feel like no one believes in them. That's where they're at their best. And I, so I wonder I, if they can get into that mindset. I, and I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I thought you were finishing. Um, we're usually good about that. Uh, I think the, w- during the pregame stuff for the next game, which to have this pivotal game five on NBA TV is such a fail by the schedule mm-hmm. makers. Let me just say that out loud and put it into the atmosphere. Also having four games on the same night and having to compete with Warriors, Kings, while uh the end of Milwaukee and Miami is happening. That just sucks. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I think a lot of the people, the talking heads on the networks are good. You're going to see that between now and tomorrow, people are going to say the bucks have a chance to come back and win the series. And I don't blame them because Miami has been inconsistent and Milwaukee does have two games in their building to try to get this turned around. And I think it, that it's going to be more popular than people expect for them to say Giannis is going to find a way to get them through here. And maybe they will be just enough, just loud enough for Jimmy and for Spo and for this group to hear it, because I think that that's the kind of stuff they'll need to um, eliminate Milwaukee on the road, which let me just say, if that happens, it, it puts a different kind of exclamation point on this season than I think we ever conceptualized could be remotely possible if you talked to us six weeks ago i i I can't believe we're here i just i I don't even want to i don't even want to try to speak it into existence because you have no idea what a heat and knicks series well you do i mean but we've never done one like that with the network i've covered them i covered four of them true i covered five of them actually if you include uh 2012 which we always forget about but uh, the the other the other four I just I can't even imagine and I I wish the Heat were fully healthy for it I really do because um, I I just think it, it would be I to have Tyler in that space too in Madison Square Garden would be a lot of fun um, and I think he I think he'd thrive on it on that environment uh, but one step at a time and not just for the Heat for the for the for the Knicks too they still got to get past uh, Donovan Mitchell in Cleveland although it appears that that's going to happen. And wouldn't that be sweet for Kevin Love, right? <laughs> he goes to the next round and the Cavs don't. There are a lot I of I didn't stories. even think about that. Wow. A lot of, he was a very happy man last night. He was so happy that he talked to me at length. And yeah, you remember I covered him in Cleveland. He didn't like me so much up there. But anyway, we won't talk about that. I'm trying not to remind anybody. Uh, thanks to Greg. We'll have another episode coming up tonight uh, or maybe tomorrow if you listen to it then. Again, check out our sponsors. Uh, and not just the ones we mentioned, although Mark Brown, PA, uh, dot com certainly him. Uh, also, I mentioned All Pro Construction Builders on the show this morning. Prize picks, use that code 5 F I V E, and also C arm and staffing.com. Get your medical equipment from Nelson and his team there. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Five on the Floor on the Five Regional Sports Network.